Broadcasting live via Think Tech Hawaii Studios in downtown Honolulu. Welcome to Top of the Line. I'm your host, Ben Lau. Aloha, and thank you for tuning in. I begin our episode with a lesser known quote by a better known person, someone you'll all recognize, someone who's affected us all. Quote, the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation that is to come, end quote. Many might not recognize the author of these words, though you're gonna recognize the author, Steve Jobs. Like Jobs, I have the utmost respect and gratitude for our best storytellers. They make a difference in our world, in our lives. Since the beginning of time, and as far as we know, the rest of time. Many of you might not recognize my guest today. He is, as Job says, one of those people. And time, time is one of the ways he is known and I trust will be remembered. He's my friend, Sir Bruce Crumley. Born in Seattle, Washington and raised in the Bay Area, inculcated with Midwestern American values by parents from the heartland of America, Iowa. Bruce has been in France since 1987, following his graduation from USC, where he majored in Slavic languages and literature and minored in Soviet studies. Bruce has penned a novel entitled Maka I Stink I. He currently writes for the 9to5Mac.com group, principally for DroneDJ.com. And he has worked for a number of leading publications, including, this is quite a list, the New York Times, The Guardian, Fortune, Sports Illustrated, AFP, which I'll have to have Bruce pronounce for us, Al Jazeera, and Time Magazine, where he was the last bureau chief in Europe, stationed in Paris, France. Covering a range of subjects, world leaders, and public figures, Bruce is recognized as an expert on the subject of terrorism and European politics. He's written extensively on a wide range of matters, covering all the important and major subjects and many of the important people and personalities. What you're seeing on screen is just but a fraction, a tiny fraction of the written work that Sir Bruce has created over his career. When I say a small fraction, I can tell you that I got up to about page eight and there were at least another 50 pages to go just on this one particular uh, site, uh, storing some of his works. And that's just one of many of the publications that Bruce has written for. He's done a lot. Recognized for his contributions to his adopted country, Bruce has been recognized by the highest in the land. Bruce has been knighted and awarded with membership to the exclusive National Order of Merit by the President of the French Republic. You'll see the medal here. You'll see the order and admission to membership up on the right side of the screen. Awarded the title Chevalier, Bruce has been awarded one of the highest honors of France. Alongside its elder sibling, the Legion of Honor, there is no higher honor. This stands Bruce in the rarefied company. The president of the French Republic is the grand master of the order and each prime minister of France is made a member after six months of service. Bruce standing by now joins us from France. Hello, Bruce. Aloha, Ben. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for thanks for agreeing to come on, Bruce. It's a real it's a real honor. It's great to see you here, Bruce. I want to dive right into serious matters with you right off the starting block. You you get the references. We're just days past the sixth anniversary of the devastating events of November two thousand fifteen, what are known as the Paris attacks. Let me try and set the backdrop. It's November thirteenth, two thousand fifteen. There's a series of terrorist attacks underway across Paris. And if I've got your career timeline correct, 
Time Magazine has at this point already closed down much of its international operations. And you've moved on, having shut down and essentially turned off the lights for time. You had been serving at this point as editor at AFP, but that's past tense. AFP being the world's oldest news agency. You've recently left that job too and are like other mere civilians watching the events unfold across your hometown city of Paris. These events are your expertise, terrorism, and you are without your counterterrorism tools, your pen, mightier than the sword as the saying goes, and your platform, a world news agency. Tell me, tell us, what's going on? How can time and other agencies not have you on Overwatch, watching from the watchtower? Well, it's, a, it's kind of a question of, of, of practicality and pragmatism. Um, you know, uh, media, legacy media had been you know, getting shellacked by the consequences of um, digital media, uh, online media. Uh, can't make enough, as much advertising money as they used to in a, when everywhere in papers and magazines. And um, the readers consume uh, news a lot differently. And so, you know, no, no, international news organization laid people off closed bureaus because they were happy about it. It was a, it was a, it was something they just had to do. Um, they had to adapt to in their coverage. And so as a consequence of that, uh, as, as you said, I'm, I'm kind of a decommissioned uh, uh, officer in, in, in the world of terrorism reporting. And, and um, when I heard the news start coming in on, on that night, um, my, my first kind of reflex was, you know, you have professional, muscle memory you, you you know immediately think oh but god i gotta get, get going i gotta start gotta think about who i can call and who might be able to tell me what's going on etc cetera, etc cetera. and a few things went through my mind very quickly a um well i can freelance this stuff but um you know uh, before i put my calls in i better make sure i have something to sell it to and second of all i the more i thought about it the more i saw the enormity of the attacks you know which wound up killing 130 people left hundreds more injured uh, including critically um, a lot of those people will be be marked for life. Uh, well, probably all of them will be like marked for life. Um, yeah, let's go back I, to the graphic, Bruce. I, I mean, I want to focus in on this. Uh, the events of 9-11, as terrible as they were, this is its own horror in its own way. And can you lay out for audiences what's going on? I mean, it's, it's a series of attacks that it happens across the city. You don't have the massive infrastructure destroyed that we did on 9-11 and you don't have the resulting invasion of a foreign country and long decades long wars, but what is going on with these terrorist attacks in your home city? I mean, what they did, they did, just didn't kill 130 people. They went on a, a killing spree. Yeah, in a way, this is a different paradigm, terrorist paradigm than 9-11 or the 2004 attacks in Madrid. I think it was 2005 attract, uh, attacks in London where you had bombings in places where there are a lot of people that could, you know, do a lot of, invoke a lot of carbonage in just a single go. In this case, you had basically what were small teams of commandos um, who were armed to the teeth with, with, with rifles and with explosives. They took over the, the Bataclan uh, concert hall when, while a, a rock concert was being staged and others just kind of leisurely walked down the, the uh, the, the boulevard about, you know, with lined with cafes it was quite a nice night out and uh, it's, you know, kind of re-gentrified part of town. It was only about a mile away from my house and um, just started picking people off. It was like something out of a, out of a, of a television, dystopian television series, you know, one of these commandos turning up and just, uh, uh, you know, taking people out. I actually, the first um, inkling I had that something was wrong. I was watching the French national team play a, uh, a, a football match uh, at the Stade de France, uh, which is just north of Paris. And sometime just after halftime, I think it was, um, this big explosion went off. The players all stopped. Everybody kind of looked and, and they, they went on it. And interestingly, people, people kind of mistook it. The announcers mistook it for a, a, a bomb, uh, what they call an agricultural bomb, which is loud, but it doesn't do a lot of damage, um, that, that some of the rowdier soccer fans used to blow in, in, in off in stadiums years back. And so a lot of people just, the announcers for the commentators said, well, it's probably just one of those. And they went on. It wasn't until later that everybody realized that this was, this was, this was something far, far vaster um, than not only than just a, a, a stadium 
prank, but 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 in terms of carnage, in terms of terror attack, it was a whole new new level of of, of slaughter. I want to get this right too, though, Bruce. When you say everyone mistakes us, I mean I was in nine eleven and I mistook what I saw, which was the towers um, already having been invaded. One of them, or actually at that point, both of them by planes. I, I my brain couldn't process it. But you're not like other ordinary human beings. You're kind of super extraordinary in ways. And you're very familiar with acts of terrorism. And I kind of wonder, are you always kind of in some of an alert mode or you're aware it takes less to trigger you being keenly aware of the possibility of a terrorist act than, than say someone like me? I, I don't know. I think everybody's different. I think everybody has different reactions. I know, I know that um, my, from what I learned um, in my work and what I've, what the, the information I was given by um, security intelligence sources, anti anti terrorism investigators, uh, the whole the whole lot. You come to look at things a little bit differently. You come to look at the broader picture, um, and I, I, I don't. I, th I think it, you tended not to. You see the threat as something larger, maybe not something quite as pressing. Not something as maybe you have to keep looking over your shoulder all the time although there have been periods including after those attacks in 2015 where you know i was very careful i'd get on a metro i'd see somebody who had left a, a suitcase you know next to the door and wasn't taking uh, paying attention to it and you know you're not supposed to do that and i'd keep a very close watch to see is this person going to stay in the metro he's going to get off he's going to leave the bag that kind of thing um so you know you're more aware but um the, the one thing though i i know um it's shocked a few people that i spoke to back in the u.s after these attacks was they said well, aren't you aren't you terrified are you going to leave the city you're going to move back here and i said no that's insane why, why would i want to do that and, well you're only a mile away you could have died and i said well, you know I, I could die by getting hit by a truck i could you know in a car accident and there's a lot of ways you could die um it's 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 you have to put these things in the perspective and i think that's one of the the goals of terrorism is to make us all lose our perspective not only in the way we see the threat is present to our, ourselves, but indeed uh, in the way we respond to them. And I remember one terror official, uh, uh, one of the, my best sources at one point told me, he says, you know, you have to always be careful that your response to terrorism doesn't trample the same rights that the terrorists are trying to take away from you by force. Um, go into more of that, because uh, we've talked about, you know, in preparation for this about having to balance the concern of doing the terrorist job for them, which is to spread terror, and reporting the news, educating the people so that if we do hear strange sounds, if we do notice uh, images or activities on the street, outside the bistros and cafes, we're more heads up. I mean, how do you strike that balance that's so seemingly impossible to, to arrive at? Again, I think it's something that everybody differs at. I mean, it's this is going to sound like a stupid comparison, but it's the kind of, uh, I was going to say the intellectual reaction, but there's a lot of emotion, a lot of psychology in play when, you know, you're talking about terrorism, you're talking about the fear factor, you're talking about being provoked into a reaction that is not your normal reaction and a level of security you normally wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't take and uh, adopt. And I, I think it's just difference per person. I mean, the stupid comparison I was going to make, it's like, Side of blood, you know, some people just saw oh, big deal. Okay, you know, let's take care of the guy, let's get, put a bandage on him or her, and you know, and, and, and move on. And other people just freak out, they can't deal with it. And again, I think it's that that differs in keeping that in mind. I think, as, as journalists, if, you, if you're covering terrorism, um, you, you, again, you have to kind of try to keep the big picture. Yes, people have just died. Yes, people are bleeding and they're maimed for life. Um, yes, this is a horrible thing, and it's, a, and, it's, and it's traumatized a lot of people, and it was attacked on just not one society, but really society at large. Um, but you also have to make sure you don't, you, you don't, um, it's already terrorizing enough that you don't have to dramatize it even further. And I think that's been a mistake that a lot of media has. And as a matter of fact, I think there's a big mistake that media has, uh, that mass media has in covering terrorism today. Um, it becomes something that people don't really follow day in and day out the way I was very lucky that I was able to, um, you know, among other things, politics and life in France, what have you, economy. But, you know, time was good about telling me, you know, yeah, you just follow this every day, you, you know, keep working on it because when, when something happens, we want you to be able to respond to that, but also put it into large perspective. I think now there's no larger perspective. It's just put the cameras on where, you know, the carnage is and 
get the box pops. This is a longer uh, conversation perhaps, and I don't want to equate uh, nor conflate what has just recently happened here on this side uh, in the United States in a town called Michigan City. Uh, I'm sorry, Oakland City, I think in Michigan. Um, we had a, a young sophomore student who's now being prosecuted as I'm reading it as an adult uh, for taking a gun, his father's, and going down his school halls and just murdering his classmates. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, as it's coming out in the news, uh, local authorities, as supported by the governor of Michigan, are seeking to charge the boy not just with murder, intentional murder, uh, the state equivalents thereof, uh, but also with terrorism uh, for inflicting terror upon his classmates. Do you have any thoughts uh, or insights about that? Uh, I've read a little bit about it. I've heard about it, um, but I, I don't. I don't have any obviously any firsthand news. I don't have any information. I've did, I don't know anything probably about less than you do about it. Um, my, my was surprised to hear that terrorism had been added to the list of crimes um, because terrorism has traditionally been a, a very specific kind of political act. It's been a. It's been. It's been maybe a, a, a legitimate political act, and I think we're all, almost all agree it is an illegitimate political act. It's an act of blind, blind violence, and indeed one that is intended to inspire, to target innocent non-combatants and inspire so much fear in that society that it, that it will react, it will succumb to the demands of the attackers. And, and that has always been the political so-called justification for those who subscribe to it of terrorism. This sounds like, uh, I won't say a random act of, 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 of violence, but um, a different, the motivation doesn't seem as politicized as, as it was, as it was, uh, for example, in the Paris attacks in 9-11. In um, and, and I think if you're going to start applying these kind of definitions to terrorism, and this, again, this is a bigger story, much open debate. I'm not making any definitive statements here. I'm just saying that if this is an act of terrorism, then you're going to have to go back and in 1999, reclassify Columbine as terrorism. You're going to have to go back into, what was it? uh 1989 i think it was or, or 1979 um and classify remember the oh i don't like mondays uh girl in uh san diego who shot off a ball a whole playground full of kids just because she was unhappy it was monday um I, oh you're gonna have to go back and requalify all those as terrorism i have the feeling we're gonna be in a situation where everything is terrorism nothing is terrorism i i i had to bring it up because it's in the news today and it's such it's just the, the link is terrorism and it's not the same kind of terrorism, but let's not stay here. Let's table this. This, this, is, this is a much deeper, longer conversation. Maybe we can come back to it. Um, let's, let's go back in time, Bruce. Terrorism, terrorism. Uh, I wanna go back to your origins. Uh, I'm gonna put up on screen these images of you when I knew you, uh, going back to when we swam together at USC. Don't um, talk about terror. <laughs> well, we called it the dungeon. It was called the dungeon for us, right? Our pool, uh, prior to the one, that beautiful one that Fred Utengsu built for us at the Utengsu Aquatic Center. So you go from there and you get invitations to the most exclusive of places, palaces, um, inner sanctums. You have uh, private audiences with world leaders. You cover those who make the news, uh, those who the news is about. You hang with uh, leading public figures. This one being uh, one of the uh, most uh, decorated I guess, uh, strikers, right? Fo uh, right? Football players in Europe. Thierry Henry, he's a, he's a uh, 1998 World Cup champion, a 2000 uh, European champion, and he was uh, a great star with uh, my, my favorite uh, Premier League team, Arsenal, who unfortunately just lost to Manchester. You know, today, so. and I and I think uh, knowing you, I think another reason why you respect him, as uh, if I understand it, you know, he's an activist. He's he's done a lot to address uh, uh, racism, discrimination, and the like. Um, and and so, well, well, let me let me get to this. This sets the frame. You're in Europe, but you came from the U.S. How do you, as an American, or and when you were Time, an American-based publication, a non-French-born journalist working for a U.S. BMF, 
how did you get access to those inner corridors of secrecy and power? How do they let you into the palace? Well, I, I think in a lot of ways, I guess you could compare um, some of the competitions I was allowed to swim in while I was at USC with some of the people I was allowed to interview when I was at Time. A lot of it is, 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 is who you're with where you're coming from, who, who's representing you, who's backing you. Um, you know, you come in with Peter Dale and coach Peter Dale and saying, you know, he's on my team and, uh, and we're USC and we're swimming here. So you know, make way for him. That's, it's kind of the same thing as when you call the, the, the Elysee palace, the presidential palace in France and say, you know, I'd like an interview with a, with a, an advisor. Or I'd like an interview with the prime, prime minister or something like that. Obviously to get an access to those kind of people um, only happens infrequently. You can get, you know, briefings from their advisors almost on a weekly basis. And, you know, you, you get, to, get to go in the same place as you would if, if you were seeing the president, the prime minister or, or ministers. But, but it, it, a lot of it is, is because you have that business card and because when those people speak to you, they know they're speaking to all that enormous audience behind that business card. Um, and that's not to say it's a shoo-in. Um, uh, just to give you a very quick, quick uh, 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 anecdote, we were turned down, I don't know how many times for the interview we wanted to do with the former French president, Jacques Chirac, um, who was featured on one of the covers that you flashed. Um, and it was in the walk up to the, um, the Iraq war. And France at that point was taking it on the chin from the US, uh, all this ridiculous things about freedom fries and, and, and cheese eating surrender monkeys and what have you, because France opposed the war. And as it turned out for very, good reason. There were no weapons of max destruction and starting war that would foment chaos in that region was worse than actually having having a horrible dictator in place. But but you state that as a fact, there were no weapons of mass destruction and, and we learned that, but that's not what people are going out and maintaining and or arguing or presenting on the floor of the UN. Uh, exactly. And and it was because in fact the French foreign minister Dominique de Vipin very forcefully basically said that's that's nonsense and we're not going to follow you. That so many um, American legislators went, 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 went um, a bit crazy and started, you know, this, this anti-French, uh, um, you know, campaign again with the, the freedom fries. I mean, how ridiculous is that freedom fries? I mean, give me a break in coalition of the willing. I mean, who, who, was, who was in the Tonga or something? You know, I, I mean, anyway, um, but the point is, is to get that interview, we, we were turned down a, a lot of times. And, and, and I finally made one last appeal to Jack Chirac's um, uh, uh, press person and, and, and put my best argument out there and, and indeed telling them why giving to us in time would give them a bigger bang for their interview buck. And I, I assumed that it worked because shortly after they said, yeah, come on in and he'll, he'll, he'll see you uh, this weekend. The uh, job, the way you describe it, the way you describe yourself as uh, certainly not immune, but, but purposefully desensitized as opposed to sensitized to, to terrorists and acts of terrorism that we can die from anything any day and that's how you're gonna live your life. You're not gonna allow the terrorists to shape who you are, how you're gonna live. I mean, that's an act of defiance in and of itself. Have, have you ever been placed in a situation where you've personally felt threatened because of your profession? Have you ever been placed in a situation where you thought you wouldn't survive it? No, the, I mean, the, the short answer is no. Um, I, I know that a couple of times when I went to New York uh, to meet with editors at time, um, just kind of touch base, um, a couple of times we'd have staff lunches and some people would ask, you know, are you ever worried? Do you think they're going to come after you? And my dance was no. I mean, why would they come after me? I'm, I'm, I'm basically repeating what, what people are telling me, and, and, you know, the intelligent sources and, and, and that's going to get out there. That could get out there um, anyway. Um, so I, I'm not any, any threat to them and I'm not blowing their cover. Um, um, the, the only time I actually felt intimidated was when um, uh, my bureau chief and I were called in um, to the, I believe it was a private residence of a, of a very high-ranking Saudi official in, in Paris who um, had been very much involved with the intelligence services. And, and apparently the, the kingdom was very unhappy about a book review of all things that Time wrote in its, it ran in its domestic edition about a book on, I believe it was 9-11 and Saudi, alleged Saudi ties 
to 9-11 and spiriting citizens out of the U.S. in the wake of 9-11 and a lot of other things that were very controversial. And, and this gentleman um, had us into his home, um, which was an entire multi-story building um, guarded by very large bodyguards. And um, he had us in and um, explained to us in no certain ter terms about just how happy um, the Saudi leadership was. And um, impressing on us importance that we convey that happiness and that unhappiness to our editors and I presume get something done about it. Um, and we, we tried to let him know that that's we're journalists, we don't do that. And we're representatives in Paris. We had nothing to do with that article and our editors are not going to change their minds anyway because of what we tell them. And um, a rather tense situation, the atmosphere got even tenser after that. And so again, I don't say I was I was in danger of my life, but I will admit that both my very chief and I were, were, were um, impressed, if not intimidated enough, that we kind of walked out and about a block down the street, just kind of went, whoa, what was that, man? That was, that was, that was pretty hairy, you know? So that, that was as close as, as it got. But, you know, this happens when geopolitics intersects with, you know, controversy and, and, and something like terrorism and, and the national security you know things happen and a later event like the murder and disassembling of the body of Khashoggi inside the uh, embassy that also may inform uh, your past experience and put it through a new prism that, that, that changed this added a bit of perspective let's say you know in in hindsight and of course it was a different situation. Mr. Khashoggi was a, 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 a longtime dissident and a very high profile crit, uh, critic of the kingdom and, you know, had, had made it clear that he was he was on for, for, for life. He was going to be battling that regime for life. And we were just called in to carry the can for, you know, an editorial choice that we didn't even know about. So, it, you know, the context is different. But yeah, you're, you're right. It, that When I read that news, it, the, that meeting did come back to mind, even though, again, it would be utter hyperbole to 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 suggest that 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 there was any ever any suggestion that we were actually gonna gonna take it on the chin well bruce we have to wrap today's session i gotta wind down but a lot of what you say strikes me um through another kind of a lens and that is seeing you uh, more than worthy of your knighthood uh there's certain <laughs> bravery and a courageousness uh that that uh, goes with you in doing your job and and as you report on your own experiences. I, I want to share just a little bit more insight with viewers into who you are, as I know you. I want to share the story of how I did some actual reporting, you know, a, a real journalist like uh, job, how I had to persuade you to allow me to even share the facts of your knighthood on this show and obtain the evidence to display it. I'm almost certain you would not have uh, allowed me to bring it up and you would have omitted mentioning it to me, but for the exchange you and I had in uh, Thanksgiving wishes uh, by way of this email on screen. And uh, we don't have time for me to read it aloud right now, but you again, just make light of it and uh, put it in an entirely different context that say someone like I or others who might probably display our medal um, or our honor. Uh, I, would, I would post it on my Facebook and my LinkedIn, be one of the first things, it's non-visible on yours. I wanna share what the real letter looks like. And, and the real order, uh, and that's on screen. Um, it certainly doesn't uh, hew to what you wrote me in the casual email. Uh, once you get up on screen is your medal um, and more about the, uh, the order, uh, exclusive membership. Um, I, I wanna share two things with viewers, Bruce. I, I want you to share your wife's response to news of your knighthood and, and the scheduling of your honoring. And then I also want you to share about uh, the meddling ceremony, how how you're how you're knighted. I'll walk you through this just extremely briefly. First of all, it's 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 a little bit different than in France than it is in in, in the UK. I mean, people don't actually call you sir. Knight knighthood is a, is a, is a rank, and there's I think it's commander and something else above that. Um, I, I, and so, so you know, it's it's knight. It's not like they, not, nobody any any. I was tapped on the shoulder with a sword or anything like that. What basically happens is once a ministry or other uh, public uh, entity uh, puts you puts your candidacy up. The order either accepts you; it doesn't. If it does, it basically says um, that we viewed your your candidacy. You seem to be a legitimate choice. Um, you're welcome to join us. Um, get somebody who's already a member to 
anoint you and you, you take care of how you do that. And so therefore, exactly how you do that is up to you. I know people have had huge receptions. I know people who had small ones, et cetera, et cetera. And basically I was agonizing on what, uh, what to do. I, I wasn't even sure at first I was gonna accept it because I, I, frankly, I think some of these kind of things, especially anything that, that, that smacks of aristocracy or that kind of thing at all. I just, it's just, it, it kind of chills me. I, I, I don't, I, I don't take it very seriously. And in case of aristocracy, actual aristocracy, I actually, actually, you know, disdain it. But um, after a while, I thought, you know, I was very proud when France allowed me to become a citizen and I was appreciative and still am. And I thought, well, you know, if it's extending me this honor, I'd be kind of a hypocrite to then, you know, wave it away. At the same time, I didn't want to do any big uh, reception. So I kind of said, what do I do with my wife? And she said, well, I, you know, I don't care, but I'm telling you, you know, I know how you feel about this. And I feel the same way you do something, make sure it's not on a weekday. Cause I'm going to be, I'm going to be working. So I ain't going to be there and don't do it on the weekend because, you know, I have, you know, spinning class and then I do, you know, weightlifting and stuff. So that's going to be pretty tight too, but you know, otherwise it's up to you. And I thought you're right. I'm just going to get somebody who is, I know who's in this order and who's uh, very much, uh, what, what, people I had most respect on earth. He's one of my best terrorism sources. As a matter of fact, he was the senior anti-terrorism uh, investigator. And we went, he agreed to do it. We went to a cafe, uh, had lunch that we always do, discuss terrorism as we always do. And when the coffee came, he said, oh, gee, we got, we got to do this fast because we're both got to go to work now. And so he read the letter, gave me the two kisses on the cheek, put the medal on and we went on our separate ways. And you think that's compliance with the order and the rights of passage. You do well, things in your own unique way. I could have grabbed a few packs of sugar and tossed them up for confetti, you know, but I just, that would have been kind of, you know, an oh, excessive show of vanity. Bruce, we have to wrap. Um, viewers, I knew this was going to be a challenge. The volume of works Bruce has created, the volume of intelligence and talent with words and his, his sharp eye and, and brilliant mind, his unique take on the world. We're gonna continue this conversation with Bruce. We will be following up this episode with another one featuring Bruce as my next guest. Uh, I can think of no better way or person I wanna wrap this year up. Um, our next episode will be my last one uh, for 2021. Uh, and I'll be back with Bruce. So Bruce, I'm going to call you that. I thank yeah. you, my friend. Yeah, I know you, I know you would. It's, it's, I've been called worse, and including by you. So I I'll thank you, that. my friend. I thank you, my hero. We haven't done this yet. So as we sign off, I'm going to raise a glass to you. I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but it's a little bit early in the day here. It's late at night there. Thank you for staying up. But I raise my glass to you, and I cheer you. Uh, mahalo for joining me today, my friend. It's been my pleasure and thanks for having me on. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think technically you can get in trouble for drinking alcohol on, on, uh, on, on live television, but I'm, I'm out of that business. I'm not going to, I'm not going to check that out. Oh, Coca-Cola viewers, <laughs> my friend and I, Bruce, we thank you until thank next you, ben. time. Thank you. From my home to yours, from me and my family to you and yours. Mahalo and aloha. <laughs>